Hello dear students. Welcome to Pen and Paper Chemistry on YouTube. I hope we are really enjoying the learning journey on the channel with pen and paper in our hand to take down notes for offline reference. Yes, a constant reminder that you need to keep these two in your hand. With this video, we start with a new topic that is solid state. And under solid state, we are specifically going to start with the imperfections or defects in the case of solids. You will see notes scrolling up on your screen. Please feel free to take either screenshots or write these notes down. They will be very, very helpful when you are not on YouTube. And in case you are not able to do either of them, please visit the site Pen and Paper Google site and there you will find these very notes in the form of PDFs. So let's get started with the topic solid state, imperfections or defects in solids. Before we define what we mean by an imperfect or defective crystal, let us define what a perfect or ideal crystal is. How would you define an ideal person? Having all the qualities, very disciplined, truthful, honest and so many things, right? So when we talk about a perfect crystal, that means a perfect crystal has a fixed or ordered arrangement of particles throughout its crystal. It follows the same pattern throughout. It will have the same unit cells, same lattice points throughout the whole crystal. Just like ideal people are very, very rare to find, same way ideal crystals or perfect crystals can only be observed at a zero Kelvin. What in thermodynamics we had defined as absolute zero. If you remember the third law of thermodynamics which states that a perfectly crystalline arrangement is possible only at absolute zero or zero Kelvin. So that means any deviation, any form of deviation from this ordered arrangement of particles would give us what we call as an imperfect or defective crystal. So that's what we have written as well. That is they show deviation in arrangement of particles as compared to perfectly crystalline arrangements. Now, how do these deviations come about? There are many factors. In fact, in the case of crystals, we actually introduce these defects in the crystals for various uses. That's why this topic is very, very interesting to learn. In fact, the mobile on which you are watching this video is also based on these defects only. Can you think of how? Ah, you must have heard about semiconductors, right? Oh yes, I love the familiar smile. So have you written down the points? Okay, now you must be wondering what are the reasons that a crystal may develop defect or what are the various ways in which these defects can be developed in the crystal. So let's go through that. When you have to obtain a crystal in pure form, cent percent, hundred percent pure form, it requires that you crystallize it at a very, very slow pace, what we call as infinitesimally slowly. So, for example, I'm going to move my pointer across the screen. I'm moving it infinitesimally slowly, very, very slowly. Yes, you're going to get bored. You're going to lose your patience if that is the rate at which we are going to crystallize. 
So practically, we actually don't do that. So under practical conditions, what do we do is, we do crystallize a substance or a crystal from its solution at quite practical and a reasonable rate so that cost wise also it should be worthy, right? So we usually do it at a more rapid rate compared to the infinitesimally slow rate that I was talking about earlier. Faster the rate at which you cool, greater will be the extent of imperfection. Sometimes we do add impurities. Stainless steel, many other forms of steel, surgical steel. So you add nickel, chromium, carbon. These kind of elements are specially added to iron in order to improve its properties. So, we do introduce impurities in the crystal while it is being formed from its solution. We can also deform a crystal by application of pressure or high energy radiations. What are these high energy radiations? So, when a crystal gets exposed to x-rays, neutrons, so what can happen is the atoms, ions, molecules, because of their small size, they can get dislocated from their respective positions. As I mentioned earlier, these imperfections are required. What are the benefits? We get a lot of benefits. They affect the mechanical behavior. You know that steel doesn't rust as easily as iron does. Electrical behavior, just now I mentioned about semiconductors. Optical behavior, right? So, even the glasses that we use, the frames of the glasses that we use, they are made by introducing imperfections or defects in the crystals. So that their fluidity is maintained. We They do not break easily. We mentioned that the extent of imperfection or defects in a crystal are dependent on the temperature and more rapid the rate or more the change in temperature, greater are the, greater is the extent of imperfection. This can be explained with the help of a simple equation. So, the question that I have posed here for you is, how is the number of defects in a crystal related to the temperature denoted by capital T? Now, these number of defects are denoted by the small n. If you can see the correlation between small n and capital T is done in the form of an exponential form. So, where n is equals to capital N, which is the Avogadro number or the total number of sides per cc of the crystal. W here stands for the work function or the energy needed to produce a defect. The work done or the energy needed. R, the universal gas constant and T, of course, our favorite temperature in Kelvin or in the absolute scale. If I express it in the form of a natural log logarithm, I'll have natural N log of N is equals to natural log of capital N minus W by 2 RT. Although this equation is not required for our grade 11 and 12 curriculum, so a general idea about this would do you good. So, we've already classified solids into two categories, perfect and imperfect or defective. Now, further, the kind of imperfections or defects in solids can be classified into two categories. We have the point defects or the line defects and plane defects. Now, why have I clubbed the line and the plane defects in one column is because we are not really going to study those at the present level of our study. Maybe when you go for your material science engineering, you would want to study more about them. 
Presently, we are more focused on the point defects and to make things easy, I have framed it in the form of a chart. I love these kind of diagrams. They make things so easy to understand. Why don't you try drawing them with your sketch pens or colored pencils? That's a quick overview of the entire diagram or the chart that we are going to study. It will be very, very helpful, I'm telling you. So, let's break it down into parts to understand what are the various defects. The point defects are further classified into stoichiometric, non-stoichiometric and impurity defects. And don't worry, we will break them down, we will study them one at a time to make things very, very clear and relatable. Stoichiometric defects are further classified into vacancy defect, interstitial defect and there are crystals having both vacancy and interstitial defect. So that's a third column. So, for example, Schottky defect is a vacancy defect. But if we talk about Frenkel defect, it's a vacancy plus interstitial defect. What do we mean by stoichiometric defects? Don't worry, don't take tension. We'll solve that as well. The second category of point defects are the non-stoichiometric defects further classified into the metal excess defect. That means the cations are greater than the anions in the case of, yes, ionic compounds. Metal deficiency defect. That means the cations are less than the anions in the case of ionic compounds. When can we have a metal excess defect? So that means either the negative charge is less or the positive ions are more. Same way, when can we have the metal deficiency defect? That means either the plus is missing, then only there will be a deficiency, or there is an extra minus. Confusing? Don't worry. When we draw and represent it diagrammatically, things will become really easy. The third kind of point defect is the impurity defect. Impurity defects are further divided into substitutional impurity and interstitial impurity. So how and where, what are the positions being occupied by the impurity? If the impurity substitutes, just like you have a substitute teacher, right? So chemistry teacher is absent today, so the biology teacher comes in to take a substitute lesson. So the substitutional impurity, so the impurity takes the place of the atom of the crystal. Interstitial impurity. Interstitial impurity is where your chemistry teacher is already there in the class, but the biology teacher comes in to help out during the lesson. So, interstitial means that the crystal now gets impurities in the interstitial, in between positions. And alloying, where I mentioned steel, is a very good example of introducing interstitial impurities. Would you like to take down this chart for future reference? Because our further videos will be based on this chart. We shall be dealing with each of these defects one at a time in greater detail. Please keep this chart ready and handy before you go on to the next video. See you there.